Hello, and welcome to the Asian Development Bank 3IE video lecture on impact evaluation for democracy and governance interventions. My name is Annette Brown. In this lecture, we have two objectives. First, I want to demonstrate to you that impact evaluation methods can be used to answer important development questions in the democracy and governance sector. People sometimes object that impact evaluation doesn't work for democracy and governance programs because they're often implemented at the national level. But you'll see here today some examples where we can use these methods to answer important questions. I also want to provide you with some new examples of different impact evaluation methods in practice. So let's start with this development question. Do democratic processes lead to better governance outcomes? You might think of a theory of change that looks like this. You start out with a local government, like a village, and it has some kind of resources, block grant perhaps, and they need to select which local projects to fund. One intervention might be a referendum. This intervention could be theorized as preferable to a standard method of a village meeting because it involves a blind ballot election. Now, the outcomes we might expect from this are first that preferences are more accurately represented, but also that we're able to represent more preferences because it's easier for people to come vote in an election than perhaps to participate in a consultation meeting. If we think that we have preferences better represented and more preferences represented, then the impacts of such an intervention may be that the allocation of resources is better aligned with citizen preferences, but also that the public is more satisfied with the political processes in their community. This study on direct democracy and resource allocation in Afghanistan sought to explore exactly that theory of change. The development program here was the National Solidarity Program implemented in Afghanistan during the knots, and in particular, we're looking at the period of 2007 and 2008. This program included the creation of community development councils in Afghan villages, and then the disbursement of block grants for village projects. Now, the process of disbursement required proposal development, selection of projects, and prioritization of projects. The authors of this study conducted a field experiment. They randomly assigned villages to two different selection processes. In the control case, the selection was done via the typical and very traditional consultation meeting. In the treatment villages, the authors implemented a referendum. Now, here we have a cluster randomized control trial because the intervention is implemented and randomized at the level of the village, but many of our outcomes are measured at the level of the individual. These authors used matched pair randomization, where they actually randomized between pairs of villages that were very similar, rather than randomizing all of the treatment across the larger sample. They ended up with 64 referendum villages and 64 meeting villages. They collected the following data. First, they did a baseline survey of individuals or households. They monitored the processes as they occurred in both the referenda and in the consultation meetings. They collected information about the outcomes of these selection processes, that is, which projects were selected. And they also conducted a follow-up survey of households. Now, even though we have a randomized control trial, and we believe that our treatment and our control groups are likely to be very similar, we always want to check baseline characteristics to see if these two groups are indeed balanced. This table shows some of the means for the village meeting groups and the referendum groups in this particular sample. So we can see, I've just circled some representative ones for you, that in fact, the baseline characteristics for the treatment villages and the control villages are very similar. We can also look at balance across one of the variables of interest, which is the project preference of the citizens in these villages. We can see that these two distributions, the first being for those people in the village meeting villages, and the second in the referendum villages, that the distributions look very similar. They're not identical, but they certainly are very similar. So given that we have balanced treatment and control groups, we can compare them in order to see whether there's an impact of this intervention of the referendum on the allocation of resources. In this table, we compare the distribution 
of the allocation outcomes between the village meeting villages and the referendum villages. Again, we can see that these two distributions are not identical, but in fact, they're very similar. A few more drinking water projects in the village meetings, a few more roads and bridges projects for the referendum villages, but this test statistic at the bottom shows you that in fact, these two distributions are not statistically different. So in this case, the intervention did not have the impact on the outcome of allocation of resources. But there was another, another outcome we were interested in, which is public satisfaction. We can look at that with the household survey data. So in this table, we see the effect of the selection method, that is the referendum, on villagers' attitudes. And we can actually separate those effects by male respondents and female respondents. So female respondents, in fact, were less likely to report that they disagreed with decisions or actions of village leaders if they came from villages that had the referendum. Female respondents were also more likely to report that they attribute positive change in the economic situation of the village to the village leaders. So these reflect positive attitudes on the part of women in the referendum villages. For men, we see that they were more likely to say that they were satisfied with the work of village leaders and more likely to perceive their own household economic situation as having improved if they belonged to the villages that had the referenda. So in this study, we see that although the intervention did not have one of the expected outcomes in the theory of change, it did have the other expected outcome, that is public satisfaction. Let's look at a second development question. Can information about local government performance motivate citizens to engage in civic activities? Here's the theory of change. We start with local governments that are performing services for individuals and in other ways governing, allocating resources, and so on. We can think about an intervention where citizens are informed of the performance of their governments. This intervention might lead to two outcomes. First, more informed citizens may be more likely to join local organizations involved in community activities. Informed citizens also may be more likely to contribute to local government projects. In the first case, these local organizations, now with more representation, may have more influence over the governments and therefore may be able to improve government performance. In the second case, there's a more direct effect. The participation of more community members in local projects directly improves local government performance. This study, Can Information About Local Government Performance Induce Civic Participation, sought to explore that theory of change for the Philippines. The development program was the Good Governance and Local Development Project, and here the implementation period explored was 2002 to 2003. The project developed and advocated for indicators of good local governance. They had an index that assessed whether public service needs were being met, whether how expenditures were prioritized, and participatory development. Now the evaluation of this project didn't seek to explore the entire theory of change, but rather to test this critical link in the middle, which is, can the intervention of informing citizens about local government performance change their behavior in terms of becoming members of local organizations and contributing to local projects? Now, there was a field experiment. That is, there were 12 sites where this index was generated, and eight of these sites were randomly selected to receive an additional intervention, which was uh, active dissemination of, of the information about this index. The researchers randomly sampled then individuals from all 12 sites and questioned them about their knowledge of the index, their membership in local organizations, and their participation in local projects. Now while they sampled 100 individuals from each of the 12 sites, they only identified 178 that had knowledge of the index or therefore were treated. Let's stop for a minute and ask whether or not we can do an RCT in this case. We do have random assignment, but we have to remember that it's at the cluster level. and Therefore, the number of clusters is very important to understanding how much statistical power we have. As it turns out, we have a small number of clusters and also a relatively small number of individual observations per cluster, particularly when you consider 
that there are only 178 treated individuals. So we don't have enough statistical power for a randomized control trial alone to measure significant impacts from this intervention. Now you might be saying, why don't we just compare those individuals that had knowledge of the governance index with those that didn't? Well, let's remember, first of all, whether or not an individual is likely to know about the index, it's not going to be random. The dissemination involved public posters, it involved uh, presentations in public, it involved comments, and we may believe that the factors that influence whether a person is likely to have received the information through one of these outlets can be correlated with whether a person engages in civic activities. That correlation creates what we call selection bias. And if we remember from the lecture on randomized control trials, selection bias is what tells us that we don't have a valid counterfactual. That is, when we have selection bias, we can't do a naive comparison between a treated and an untreated group. So in this case, the uh, researchers did an evaluation using a quasi-experimental method in order to reduce the impact that selection bias has on the estimates of impact. The method they used is propensity score matching, which you learned about in the video lecture on quasi-experimental methods. This method, propensity score matching, uses observable characteristics to predict whether a person has knowledge of, an in, of the index and uses those estimated probabilities of being treated to match people who actually are treated with people who are not treated, and then compares the outcomes across those matched individuals. This diagram shows you a little bit about these two samples for this study. The red are those who actually are treated, and the blue are those who are not. But the length of the bar tells you something about the distribution of these propensity scores, that is, the observable characteristics. We can see that these two groups are different on their observables, so we don't want to do a naive comparison. And so what propensity score matching allows us to do is to just compare within these bars where we have people who have similar observable characteristics. Okay, so what are the results then? Can we measure impact? This is a complicated table, but I'm going to start with this upper left quadrant to show you a little bit about the different uh, kinds of propensity score matching methods. The authors here used a variety of statistical methods for propensity score matching in order to show that their results were robust to different statistical methods. So here we can see that using the six different methods in the rows, they were always comparing the same group of treated individuals, people who actually did have knowledge of the governance index, with different groupings of non-treated individuals. Nevertheless, this quadrant shows you that the estimated effects, the treatment, um, was roughly the same across all of these methods. That is, those people who did have knowledge of the governance index were all between 35 and 40 percentage points more likely to be members of local organizations. And the T-statistics show you that these estimates are highly statistically significant. We also see that the effects that are measured on whether or not the individual participates in the local government project are also very consistent across the propensity score matching methods. So those who receive the treatment are all 33 to 37 percentage points more likely to participate. And again, the T-statistics show you that these estimates are statistically significant. So in sum, I've shown you some evidence that direct democracy, that is a referendum for project selection, can increase citizen satisfaction about projects and processes, even if it doesn't change the allocation of resources. I've also shown you some evidence that information about government performance can indeed induce citizens to engage in civic activities. I've given you one example of a randomized controlled trial in the democracy and governance sector and another example of propensity score matching in democracy and governance. Thank you for watching. I hope you have found this video useful in learning about impact evaluation for democracy and governance. I encourage you now to view the video lectures related to the other development sectors.